climate. So this event is one in a series of gatherings where we're deliberately bringing thought leaders together from both sides of the aisle and from different sectors of the economy and society in an effort towards to move towards a more shared understanding on the imperative and a common plan for action. I think if you just look in the last year or so, it's given some really strong indications that leaders of both the right and the left, as well as world religious leaders and cultural icons alike, are increasingly seeing global climate change as a shared human issue. For example, the Risky Business Project, which assesses the economic risk of climate change in the United States, is, is it led by perhaps the most unusual collection of business and policy leaders. Um, the group's led by Hank Paulson, obviously a Republican and the former chief executive of Goldman Sachs and the Treasury Secretary under President George Bush, Michael Bloomberg, an independent and New York City's former mayor, and Tom Steyer, uh, the former hedge fund manager who we hosted here at UNH uh, earlier this year. The 2014 report concluded that the US economy faces significant risks from unabated climate change. And they said every year of inaction serves to broaden and deepen those risks. In September 2016, um, in remarks to the largest gathering of world leaders in UN history, close to 200 prime ministers and presidents and other leaders, Pope Francis, the leader of 1.2 billion Catholics, made an important call to action and proclaimed the existence of a right to the, of the environment. In particular, he highlighted that climate change will have unequal consequences and untold suffering for the poor. And then in December of last year, the leaders of some 200 countries met in Paris and agreed to the most sweeping deal ever to limit carbon emissions. So these examples and many others suggest that the world is shifting, that there is a growing social consensus, at least among world leaders, on the urgent need for climate change action. One of these leaders is Mr. Jerry Taylor, and we're really honored and delighted to welcome him here today to make the conservative case for acting on climate, why putting a price on carbon matters. Mr. Taylor is the president of the Niskanen Center, which he established in 2014. It's a libertarian, nonprofit think tank that works to change public policy. Prior to founding the center in 2014, Mr. Taylor spent 23 years at the Cato Institute, where he served in many roles, ultimately as a member of the senior management team. Before that, he was staff director for the Energy and Environment Task Force at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Over the past two decades, Mr. Taylor has been one of the most prominent and influential libertarian voices in energy policy in Washington. He's the author of numerous uh, policy studies, he's testified before Congress, and he's appeared uh, on numerous television shows and in prominent news outlets. Some of us were lucky, to ha lucky enough to have lunch with Mr. Taylor a little while ago, and he shared his really interesting personal journey with us. Um, in terms of his understanding of climate change and the need for action. And I'm really excited that he's gonna share some of those thoughts with us now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that kind introduction, Fiona, that I wrote for you. You <laughs> gave it very well. My name is Jerry Taylor. I am the president of the Niskanen Center in Washington, D.C. As Fiona mentioned, for most of my career, for over 20 years, I was at the Cato Institute, where for the most part, I was responsible for the energy and environmental work that Cato did. And during the bulk of my career, I spent myself on the other side of this conversation. I would come to college campuses and argue against doing something about climate change, against the idea that climate change was a significant risk. And I shared these ideas on Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and the you know, various other newspapers and other radio shows and op-ed pages and whatnot. But I came to change my mind. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why I've changed my mind about these. I haven't changed my mind about the role of government. I haven't changed my mind about free markets. I haven't under changed my mind about uh, the, the fundamental ideas that uh, the government is here to, to defend your right to life, liberty, and property. And that's pretty close to the entire range of what uh, government should be engaged in doing. But that doesn't color how I look at atmospheric physics, and nor should it color how you look at climate issues. So when I left the Cato Institute, I didn't do so entirely because of climate, though that was one of the reasons I did decide to start the Cato, uh, excuse me, the Niskanen Center when I left the Cato Institute. I did so because I thought libertarians had done a very poor job of promoting their ideas in American politics. That's a long conversation for another time. Uh, but we decided to come out of the gate on climate change because the political right, in my opinion, also the cause of liberty, has been very poorly served by the policy of denial. 
Equally important, we believe that in the Scannon Center, the conservatives and libertarians have at their disposal the very best remedies for addressing the climate problem, which is the power of markets in the invisible hand. But before I get to that, let me offer you a few of my priors about this conversation, some of which I'm sure many of you share. And if uh, there are those of you who are like the former me, who sat skeptically through these sorts of uh, lectures, I hope you're here, because I'd like you to also uh, follow the journey that I had to follow. First of all, there's very little scientific doubt that global warming is happening and industrial emissions are the cause. This is not a new faddish science, which is something that uh, uh, libertarian friends of mine at the Cato Institute had once argued. CO2 was identified as a greenhouse gas all the way back in the 1860s. In 1906, Swedish scientist Fante Ehrenhaus used straight physics and math to, con to conclude that, quote, any doubling of the percentage of CO2 in the air would raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by 4 degrees Celsius. Now, 110 years later, with new data, better understanding of climate interaction, the emergence of paleoclimate historical research, and the computational powers harnessed by computer modeling to make sense of all this, has added additional strength to Aaron House's projection. Four degrees Celsius is within the range of the likely outcome from a doubling of background levels of CO2, according to the IPCC. It's a bit on the high side, but everything that we have learned since 1906 has verified what very simple physics and math can demonstrate for us. We don't need computer models to tell us this. If, if our understanding of basic physics is correct, we know that putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will indeed lead to warming. Now, four degrees Celsius may not sound like much, but the range of variation between distinct climate regimes is only on the order of around five degrees Celsius. The world was only four degrees cooler Celsius during the last ice age prior to industrialization. Moving temperatures in the opposite direction flirts with equally extreme climate conditions. Now, this isn't news. This is not part of my personal journey from skeptic to uh, mainstream on this topic. If you look at the scientific the scientist that the skeptic community offers up in this conversation, who testifies in front of James Inhofe or Ted Cruz, or who's offered up by my friends on the right as offering counter-narratives. These scientists, uh, John Christie, Richard Lindzen, Pat Michaels, Bob Balling, Judith Curry, Willie Soon, I know almost all of them. They would all concede what I've just told you. In other words, if you were to ask Ted Cruz to identify a scientist who argues that the globe is not warming, that industrial emissions have nothing to do with the climate's temperature, and that this is entirely a statistical anomaly, a hoax, or some misunderstanding, or, or some ideological jihad, you would not be able to find a climate scientist who would argue that. Even the skeptic climate, climatologists uh, agree with the general thing that I've just told you. They believe that warming will be on the low side of projections, most mainstream scientists think it'll be at the middle level or even high side. That's what the scientific debate is about. But the conservative street, those who turn out and yell Trump, 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 and the people who vote for Ted Cruz and a lot of my former friends, they are utterly disconnected from the scientific authorities that they are allegedly citing to back their own positions. So that's my prior number one. Prior number two is that climate change imposes serious risks. This likewise is not at issue even amongst climate scientists. The fact is there is a lot we don't know about the climate. There is uncertainty. The uncertainty, however, cuts both ways. So for instance, the most likely outcome of a doubling of pre-industrial levels, uh, pre levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, according to the IPCC, is a temperature increase of somewhere between 3 degrees Fahrenheit and 8 degrees Fahrenheit. If the current policy path we're on continues by the year 2100, we will see warming somewhere between, according to the IPCC, the most likely scenario, is somewhere between 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit and 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, likely, according to the IPCC parlance, means a 66% chance. So that's not really the full distribution of possible outcomes. That's the most likely outcome. There is about a 10% chance, if the IPCC is correct, that future warming in 2100 will exceed 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, there are a lot of error bars here. There is a world of difference between 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit warming and 11 degree Fahrenheit warming. And this is where the debate, the scientific debate anyway, is. The skeptics say it'll be on the low end, and more mainstream scientists say the middle of the high end. The error bars are large because we've never seen such high atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases in all of human history. We literally have no data points whatsoever to inform our expectations about future climate. We do, however, have paleoclimate records, which provide us clues 
with what may occur. Because we have indeed, prior to the emergence of man, seen or believed that we can detect traces of greenhouse gas concentrations at the levels we're talking about. Two points in particular. The last time the Earth experienced concentrations of greenhouse gases that were on track for producing by mid-century was during the middle of the Pliocene epoch some three million years ago. Temperatures then were three and a half to six and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today, and sea levels were 30 to 65 feet higher than they are today. If emissions reductions promised by the uh, recent Paris Agreement uh, do not come to pass, let's assume they're just empty promises, so we're on our current trajectory, then by the year 2100, we'll likely have greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere that we saw in the early Eocene some 50 million years ago. Temperatures then were 16 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on this planet than they are today. Now, of course, it may take time for the atmosphere and the climate to adjust to greenhouse gas emission loads, or may not. There are, a lot of, there are not implausible arguments out there, including some very interesting recently published papers that suggest that the climate can adjust abruptly and dramatically far quicker than we think. The fact is, however, we just don't know. So that is a sort of honest representation of what the scientific debate really is all about. Despite what Ted Cruz would tell you, it's not about whether it's happening. It's not about whether industrial emissions have anything to do with it. It's whether the climate is really has low sensitivity to these emissions or medium or high sensitivity to these emissions. And each side offers uncertainty to justify its positions, right? If you're an environmentalist, then you're going to talk about the precautionary principle. We have to assume the worst. We can't take chances, do no harm. We have to, we're compelled to act in the face of uncertainty. And conservatives use the uncertainty to justify their position. Before they say we go Amish and throw out fossil fuels and deindustrialize and dance with the wolves and everything the deep greens want us to do, we damn well better be sure and we're not sure enough because climate change could conceivably, even according to the IPCC, be a relative non-event. And they offer this uncertainty on both sides to justify their position. So what are we supposed to do with that? The uncertainty is very real. And it turns out risk preferences are subjective how much risk you're willing to take in your life. There's no right answer to this question. There's no objectively correct level of risk tolerance. There's no objectively correct willingness to pay to avoid risk. So it looks like a big soup of subjective preferences about how much risk we want to take. And in politics, of course, conservatives use this to their advantage. I used to use it to my advantage. I was on their side of the debate. I would say that conservatives and libertarians are the manly risk tolerant types that allowed civilization to grow and liberals are those squeamish thumb sucking, sucking risk averse types that if we ever listened to them we never would have invented fire in the first place right because there are risks associated with that too that's the way this debate is often portrayed on the right but it's not a matter of ideology it's a matter excuse me it's not a matter of risk tolerance and risk preference it's not even a matter of ideology as far as how much risk you're willing to take it's a matter of what issues are in play I dare you, if you think conservatives are risk tolerant, turn on Fox News and watch them talk about Syrian refugees. It turns out that when foreign policy is at issue, when ISIS is at issue, when these horrific Syrian refugee killing machines are at issue, conservatives are the ones under their bed sucking their thumb, totally risk tolerant, and it's risk intolerant, and it's liberals who are risk tolerant. So what happened to our narrative? Let me read you a statement from Dick Cheney to this effect, which is very interesting. After 9-11, you may or may not recall, there's a brief, a brief flurry of concern about whether Pakistani scientists were siphoning off nuclear technology and weaponry to Al-Qaeda. And there was a brief conversation in the United States about what to do about that. Here's what Dick Cheney had to say about that matter. Quote, if there is even a 1% chance the Pakistani scientists are helping Al-Qaeda build or develop a nuclear weapon. We have to treat it as a certainty in terms of our response, end quote. Imagine if he had said the same thing about climate change. Imagine if Al Gore had said the same thing about climate change. The right would go berserk. But since we're talking about things that the right hates, they become very, very risk intolerant. So it's, my point here is that this is a risk management challenge. These are risks that are not unlike risks we face in any other policy arena, and we can't just say uncertainty precludes any action. And that's mostly because the most likely outcome from climate change, which is what this debate, the science debate, really is all about, really, is it low end, which is what my former colleagues at Cato and elsewhere have said, is it more mainstream or high end, which is what the IPCC says. This is the wrong question. 
A hot debate about the most likely outcome misses the point. It's the full range, the full distribution of possible outcomes that is the real issue and can play here. We don't make decisions in our own lives or in other public policy arenas about the most likely outcome. The most likely outcome, for instance, is that ISIS is just a flash in the pan and like the anarchist movement of over 100 years ago, will come and it will go. Do we treat them that way? No, because there are a low probability but a high impact scenario in which that isn't true. So we don't care what the most likely outcome of radical Islamic terrorism might be. We care about the full distribution of possible outcomes. In financial markets, we behave that way when we have no ideology at all in play, when we're just looking at risks in any other context. If we cared only about the most likely outcome of what we did with our money, there would be no Goldman Sachs, there'd be no Deutsche Bank, there wouldn't be a Wall Street. We just park our money in equities, 100% of it, buy stocks, buy an index fund, walk away. The most likely outcome in any given year is that will give you the best return on your cash. Do we do that? No, we know that there's a distribution of possible outcomes any given year, we hedge against risks, we look at the full distribution of possible outcomes and we act accordingly. When ideology is not in play, we look at the full range of outcomes. And the reality is when it comes to climate changes, even the low end of the IPCC estimates about what will happen will indeed have significant impacts on the globe. It may not be cataclysmic book of revelation stuff, but it will not be inconsequential. The high end scenarios are truly catastrophic. They are truly near sci-fi in proportions. They may be low probability, but they are high impact, and it does make sense to hedge against them. So, I used to understand all of this. All right? Believe it or not, I was a skeptic who argued, save for the fact about the full distribution of outcomes being the main issue, everything I just told you, most well-informed skeptics understand, or at least try not to publicly acknowledge, but they understand these issues full well. But they'd rather have a debate not be about the full distribution of possible outcomes because then you lose, once that's in play. And so what I used to do when I was on the other side of this issue, I'd say, well, look, we can't, we would spend ourselves bankrupt trying to address every single low probability, high impact scenario, whether we're talking about asteroids hitting the world, under the globe, pandemics, bioengineered things getting out of control, if we were to look at every one of these things and hedge against them, there's a budget constraint. We can't do it all. But it turns out there are ways to address some of these problems without bankrupting the economy. I'll get to that in a second. The other thing I used to argue is that maybe so, but the most likely outcome of climate change can't cost a, pass a cost-benefit test. Say so no matter what we think, the most likely outcome means that if we address climate change and decarbonize the economy, basically throw out oil, gas, and coal, that's exactly what we have to do by around mid-century if we hope to reduce the risk of runaway climate change in any significant fashion. That is a very costly endeavor. It's not cheap and it's not easy. It'll have major economic impacts. And if you tally up the costs associated with tossing out fossil fuels within the next several decades versus the benefits, it doesn't pass. Will not happen. Well, first of all, to my old self, I would now say, given the incredible uncertainties associated with how significant climate change will be, 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 11 degrees Fahrenheit, and given the uncertainties about how the economy responds, if you think the error bars associated with what will happen in the future climate are big, the error bars are even larger if you look at the economic models that try to put a price tag on action. Because we don't know anything about the technologies 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years will be from now. What the economy is going to look like, all sorts of things. The economic models are even less reliable than the climate models. And again, they're not reliable, not because we don't have good credentialed people churning away at this, it's that there's a lot that's unknown. Given the huge unknowns in climate impact and the huge unknowns in the price tags associated with clean energy and energy efficiency and future nuclear and things like that, you can't say anything very confidently about the costs and the benefits of addressing climate change. And anybody who speaks confidently on this matter either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're flim flam artists, and that, regardless whether on the left or the right, there's too much that's completely unknown. So what do we do given all this uncertainty? Well, uh, there was a recent survey of economists, not environmentalists, not Al Gore uh, uh, campaign workers, not Greenpeace members or anything, not people who work for Tom Steyer, but credentialed economists who published in the peer-reviewed academic literature on climate economics, and they asked them the question, given all these uncertainties, what do you think is the right policy? 50% of them support, quote, immediate and drastic action, given these uncertainties. 
43% support, quote, some action. I've just totaled 93%. 5% say we need to support more research first before we make a final decision. 1% of the published economists who've written on this topic say, quote, not a serious problem. So when I was at the Cato Institute on the other side of this position, one of the many things which made my position increasingly untenable in my mind is that I would have to work really damn hard to find an economist, no matter how free market, in the academic world who would take the position that I was offering in public debate. Even so, even given the uncertainties on cost-benefit analysis, I'm not sure they're that important. Let's assume that you could demonstrate to me that there's a really good chance that the cost associated doing something with, uh, uh, to address climate is greater than the benefits. So what? I am a libertarian. I believe that the role of government is to protect people's rights to life, liberty, and property from harm done by others. And if party A is destroying har party B, or causing harm to party B. If you're going to tell me that if A gains more than B loses, it's all good, well, that's an argument that sits very uncomfortably with conservatism and libertarianism. Government's job is to protect your life and liberty and property from harm being done by others, even if the guy's name is Charles Koch. It doesn't matter. And so even if it doesn't pass a cost-benefit test, in other words, even if the polluters gain more than the victims of pollution lose, it doesn't matter if you're a principled libertarian. You compensate the losers. If you don't enjoin the pollution, you at least compensate them. Maybe, say, through a carbon tax, and then allow the proceeds to go to adaptation or mitigation. So, in any other context, libertarians like my old self, who had argued cost-benefit, would find themselves arguing exactly the opposite in every other arena of public policy which I found very difficult to continent. Finally, my final prior here, is this is really not a debate. Even though I've spent a lot of time justifying to you why I think that society should act and act aggressively to address greenhouse gas emissions, and I hope I've been persuasive. But even if I have not, and there's the old me in this audience, this, conversa this ship has sailed. There is no conceivable scenario in which conservative brute political force, whether under Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or James Inhofe or whatever scenario you're looking at, is going to be able to roll back climate action at the federal and state level. It's not possible unless you think there's going to be a world in which the Democrats can't find 40 votes to filibuster in the Senate. The reality is the Supreme Court has already ruled that the Clean Air Act governs greenhouse gas emissions as long as the agency finds that they are a threat to human health and the environment. That endangerment finding was made. If a future Republican president were to undo that endangerment finding and thus pull the Clean Air Act back, that president would face a legal challenge in the courts, where under the Administrative Procedures Act, the administration is going to have to prove that there is a preponderance of scientific evidence justifying that move. There is no way that the, a Republican administration would ever win that legal challenge. Never. If there is not a preponderance of evidence in the literature that climate change is a significant risk to human health and the environment, then it doesn't exist anywhere in any field anywhere. All right. So they can't win. The only way my friends at the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, who would like to see no climate action is to succeed, is if they rewrite the Clean Air Act. Because the Clean Air Act requires the EPA to act if greenhouse gas emissions are found to be a, a risk. So you have to rewrite the Clean Air Act. And unless the Democrats are just going to not show up for work one day, it's pretty hard to imagine that ever getting through the United States Senate. It's pretty hard to imagine Republicans holding a majority in the United States Senate after November for as long as I can imagine. But 60 seats? Well, that's some, that's, you talk about science denial, there's some policy denial going on as well. So, in my mind, even if you're unconvinced by the need to act on climate change, the decision to act has already been made. The only real question in public policy is how we are going to address greenhouse gas emissions. Are we going to do it through a thousand cuts, through regulatory initiatives here, there, and everywhere, where the EPA and other regulatory agencies are going to micromanage energy decisions, provide subsidies for you, but not for you, and we're going to goose this R&D, but we're not going to be paying that much attention to that sort of science uh, answer to climate change, and we are going to require emissions reductions in this sector of the economy, and not so much in this sector of the economy, and not for you farmers, because you're politically connected. Is this how we're going to address climate change to the extent to which we're going to get rid of 80% of fossil fuel use by 2050 if we're going to be on track to ever meet the two degrees Celsius target we're trying to meet? 
Or does it make more economic and policy sense to simply put a naked and clean price on greenhouse gas emissions via a carbon tax, make it economy-wide without exception, and then use the revenues produced by the tax to offset the costs associated with the mitigation and be done with it? In my mind, when I started this conversation out by saying libertarians and conservatives have something to add here besides denial, they actually have to add, in my opinion, what is the very best remedy to climate change, arguing that price signals and market forces will do more good than naked brute force regulation is what God put libertarians and conservatives on this earth to argue. And in the climate arena, they have a tremendous policy weapon to put on the table. And it's a policy argument, by the way, that doesn't require a great deal of lift on the political left as well. This position, that it is far better to throw out EPA regulation, greenhouse gases, and all the subsidies, and all the interventions, and go with a simple price on carbon, is the position of James Hansen. It's the position of Al Gore. It's the position of virtually every serious environmentalist I have ever talked to. The trick is, can we do it? And then the Scanner Center, we're trying to convince consumers they ought to. But that's the political challenge, because most of America already agrees we have to do something about climate, 70 odd percent, according to every single poll I've ever seen taken on planet Earth. The GOP is the main roadblock. But elected Republicans, in my opinion, are out of touch with their own base. You wouldn't know it through the primary season. But I have seen survey after survey after survey after survey. So it's not just one poll, two polls, three polls. It's every poll ever published on the subject find somewhere around 56% of Republicans and even 54% of self-identified conservatives who support regulating CO2 as a pollutant. Even Republicans, by a majority, and even conservatives, a majority of conservatives, agree that we need to do something about greenhouse gas emissions. But only 36% of self-identified Tea Party Republicans support that. And it is the Tea Party, at present, that holds the Republican Party hostage. It is the moving force within the primary season, as we can very clearly tell. And given their predominance within the GOP, they have essentially held the entire party in prison and imprisoned them within this policy of denial. I can't tell you the number of Republicans, elected senators and House members that I've met in Washington over the last two years who I've talked to about this issue, whose private conversations are wildly at odds with their public pronouncements on climate change. They understand both the, the policy problem. They may not be full Al Gore, you know, environmentalists. They may still be somewhat agnostic about whether this is a problem that requires a significant policy response. But they're not blind to the politics. They know that their position is not sustainable for much longer politically in American politics. And they also understand that the regulations that they decry, like the Clean Power Plan, aren't going to go away because they gave fiery speeches. The only way to get less costly regulation is to provide an alternative. And I think that's the challenge that we're trying to address. Now, but why is it that we have such a hard time? Why is the conservative street so weirdly opposed to climate action? Again, it doesn't, how you feel about the role of government should have nothing to do with how you feel about physics. So why is it these things are married? Well, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, the conservative street doesn't like the message that we need government to regulate. Conservatives generally don't like regulation. Uh, they don't like the messengers, environmentalists. They're part of the other tribe. They're distrustworthy bastards. That's the way conservatives look at it. Um, and they fear the overheated rhetoric of climate alarmists is a portent of where this policy train is heading. And boy, when I was on the other side of this debate, I used to go to town on this one. So, for instance, I would pick up Al Gore's book, Earth and the Balance. I'd find this statement in his book, quote, we must, we must make the rescue of the environment the central organizing principle of civilization. Holy crap. I mean, you tell a conservative or a libertarian that the central organizing principle of civilization needs to be something, no matter what it might be, and he's going to get the willies. But let's say we're going to even qualify and just say government, because he said civilization. He didn't say, he, he didn't say government. He said all, it's like an authoritarian regime, right? But let's just say, let's say we were charitable, and Al Gore really meant the central organizing principle of government. Once again, that doesn't really help much. Most libertarians, if you gave them sodium pentothal, would say, look, the central organizing principle of government is to protect my rights to life, liberty, and property. If you're not in that wheelhouse, I'm not there. It is not to draft me into some sort of environmentalist jihad. 
And, but if I sign up on this climate change train, this is exactly what these people have in mind. Central organizing principle of civilization is to become a professional Greenpeace member, which is the way they look at it. Naomi Klein has a book called This Changes Everything. Some of you may have heard of it, read it. If you haven't, let me give you a brief summary. Naomi Klein, public intellectual on the left, says, you know, capitalism has long had its problems, and I've long argued, says Naomi Klein, that capitalism probably needs to be thrown aside, but if there was ever any doubt, it's gone now. Climate change settles this conversation. Capitalism is done for. It can't address this problem. Only the state can address it through central planning and this sort of thing. Capitalism is the problem, not the solution. That's what Naomi Klein says. And you can't believe the number of people who are gunslingers on the right who do the job that I used to do who say, you want to know what this is all about? Read Naomi Klein's book. It is just another way of gutting capitalism. It is just, an, it, this is exactly where this freight train is going to head. Do you want to buy a ticket? Well, most conservatives and libertarians aren't going to sign up for that. They're not going to Bernie Sanders rallies. Uh, even though, in some ways, they probably should for other reasons, but we'll <laughs> put that in. And finally, a lot of environmentalists uh, romanticize deindustrialization. How many times, if you're an environmentalist, you've gone to meetings where people talk about, geez, why are we so obsessed with that economic growth? Why can't we just learn to live with what we've got? Isn't happiness and contentment and spiritual health best experienced by personal relationships that have nothing to do with money? Well, most people hear this and say, oh, you want me to go Amish too? So we have to destroy capitalism, and I have to give up on wealth and all this stuff so I can become one with nature, and that's the route to happen. Conservatives and libertarians who hear that think this is, again, what's really in play. This is why the conservative street instinctively resists this issue and resists address, taking climate change seriously, because they don't like the implications of what it may mean for them. Now, my argument, however, to those conservatives is that pricing carbon, preferably via a carbon tax, and using the proceeds to cut other taxes allows us a solution to climate change that does not increase the size of government. The money goes back to the people. It doesn't stay in the Treasury. And in fact, it's a net deregulation. We are already taxing carbon. We do it indirectly through regulation. We do it costly, ineffectively, unevenly, inefficiently. It's a mess, but it's kind of invisible. Let's make it visible and let's clean it up and make it less costly. And this is a, far, this is, this is a net reduction in the size of government, not an increase in the size of government. And it harnesses capitalism to address the problem far better than the government could do so under the levers of state central planners. And this is why conservatives can steal this issue and show that their fundamental ideas are actually earth friendly despite what Naomi Klein would have you think. But finally, some people will never be moved on this. And that's certainly true, but more I think can be moved than you might suspect. And I think conservatives need to be reminded about what they ostensibly believe. Allow me to leave you with uh, a quote from somebody I think very highly of, Friedrich Hayek. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he was one of the most important libertarians of the 20th century. Uh, he's a Nobel laureate economist. Uh, he's the author, quite famously, of a book called The Road to Serfdom, uh, which is a real favorite on the Tea Party circuit. Glenn Beck loves it. Sarah Palin loves it. Uh, Michelle Bachman loved it. Uh, Ted Cruz quotes it all the time. Uh, if there's a patron saint of the Tea Party right, it's F.A. Hayek. Um, he's, however, less remembered for an essay he once wrote called Why I Am Not a Conservative. This is what he had to say, one of the most important reasons why he wasn't a conservative. Quote, personally, I find the most objectionable feature of conservative attitude is its propensity to reject well-substantiated new knowledge because it dislikes some of the consequences which seem to follow from it. Or, to put it bluntly, it's obscurantism. I will define that for you as, quote, definition of obscuritism, the practice of deliberately preventing the facts or full details of something from becoming known, unquote. Continuing Hayek, quote, I will not deny that scientists, as much as others, are given to fads and fashions and that we have much reason to be cautious and accept the conclusions that they draw from their latest theories. But the reasons for our reluctance must themselves be rational and must be kept separate from our regret that the new theories upset our cherished beliefs. By refusing to face the facts, continues Hayek, the conservative only weakens his, only position, his own position. Should our moral beliefs really prove to be dependent on factual assumptions shown to be incorrect, it would hardly be moral to defend them by refusing to acknowledge facts. Now, Friedman was talking about the hot debate around, about evolution in his day. But the very same sentiments apply, in my opinion, to the climate change debate today. Thank you for listening, and thanks for coming. I look forward to the conversation that will follow.
We've asked two, uh, two leaders to come and give a response to Mr. Taylor's remarks. Uh, first, Joe Keefe, President and Chief Executive Officer of Paxworld Funds and its investment advisor, Paxworld Management. I'll share one fun fact about Joe. In 2015, the Financial Times named him one of its 10 top feminist men in the world. That's correct, the top feminist men in the world. That's a conversation for another day about why he was named that. Uh, but Joe, as a business leader, both leading his own uh, business, but also having incredible insight into the business community through, through the pa work at Pax World, is going to give us a response based on the business community to some of the ideas that Jerry shared with us today. Next up, we'll hear from Michael Etlinger. Michael is the director of the Carsey School for Public Policy. He joined us here in July 2014 and is responsible for overseeing the growth of the existing research and outreach program and developing new academic programs like the CAS's new Masters in Public Policy, which is la launching this fall. Before joining CAS, uh, Michael was, was uh, at several Washington, D.C. think tanks and uh, most recently was the, the Pew Charitable Ch Trusts. So um, I'd like to at this time invite uh, Joe Keefe up to the podium to share a few remarks with us. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, that was great, Jerry. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing the, uh, uh, the panel with you today. Um, uh, just a few comments, uh, the, sort of from the business perspective or the investor perspective, and then maybe a few questions that maybe might help further open up the conversation. Um, first of all, um, I think what Jerry says should really be welcome, and I would start sort of at the end, really, with where we talked about the ideological, or Jerry talked about the ideological sort of divide on this, but how putting a price on carbon or carbon tax, allowing markets to be part of the solution, if not predominantly the solution, is not a way to get beyond the sort of stale ideological debate um, and, and, and making this a left-right issue, which gets, therefore gets it stuck in Washington, D.C. political paralysis, or even worse, public policy paralysis. Um, if you read his writings on uh, the carbon tax in particular that flows from the comments this morning, and although and Jerry did touch upon this, I mean the alternative to a carbon tax, carbon tax, excuse me, that Jerry argues very persuasively, is not doing nothing. That is not a credible alternative. It is not hoping that elections bring in, as Jerry said, you know, 61 votes for the Republicans in the U.S. Senate. It's not hoping that lawsuits somehow derail the EPA and put off the day of reckoning. The alternative to a carbon tax, or putting a price on carbon, is not only more regulation, but perhaps a hodgepodge of badly thought through, badly designed regulation and legislation put in place in piecemeal fashion over time that does more harm than good, or at least doesn't get at the fundamental problem. Um, Jerry also talks about in his papers and today that skeptics, climate skeptics, and those who are opposed to addressing climate change are fundamentally ignoring risks and costs that in all our other, other, other aspects of our life, in the way we invest and so forth, and Jerry talked about diversifying risk through investments, we address. Um, and I think it is that economic risk and it is those economic costs, in addition to whatever moral grounds may be there for doing something, which is the reason why the business community and the investor community right now are frankly way out in front of the public sector, way out in front of government um, in addressing this, is, this issue. Businesses and investors understand that because we are not pricing those risks and pricing those costs, markets are already being distorted by the fact that some industries are allowed to dump carbon into the atmosphere for free and pass on the costs of dealing with this externality to the rest of us. And in addition to the risk side, a second reason why I think the business community and the investor community have gotten out ahead of government on this issue is the opportunity side. I think businesses and investors understand that market solutions, to, under, to underscore Jerry's point, may indeed be more efficient, more effective, and may create the opportunity for business, more opportunity, I should say, for business growth and profit, win-win scenarios from private sector perspective, than command and control legislation and regulation. So market 
actors addressing climate change through price signals as opposed to regulators addressing climate change through legislation and regulation, it's not only more potentially more attractive to conservatives, to go to Jerry's point, but it's potentially more attractive and I think is more attractive to businesses and the investment community as well. Simply put, the transition from an industrial age economy powered by fossil fuel to a sustainable economy creates a whole new landscape of opportunity for businesses and investors that they are keenly interested in. In fact, so far, so much so are businesses and investors ahead of government on this that there are those who are even in the absence of a carbon tax, in an ab absence of a, of a market solution, are actually coming out for command and control regulation and legislation because they think something should be done. Several major companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, Ikea, and Mars, just filed a friend of the court brief, um, an amicus brief, in support of the EPA's clean power plan citing the need for a national carbon mitigation strategy, citing costs and risks, as well as the multiple environmental, economic infrastructure and other benefits that would flow uh, from addressing climate. Uh, they're calling for uh, the Clean Power Plan to be upheld. 150 major companies have signed on to the White House's Clean Power Pledge. Prior to the climate talks in Paris this past November, December, um, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Hershey's, General Mills, Unilever, Kellogg, Nestle, all the major leaders in the food and beverage sector signed a joint letter to the U.S. and global leaders encouraging them to adopt a robust international climate agreement citing the effects of drought, flooding, hotter growing conditions and so forth on the world's food supply. So, and shortly after the agreement was signed in Paris, 500 major institutional investors from around the world commanding 20, $22 trillion in assets gathered at the United Nations to try to mobilize trillions of dollars to help catalyze the shift to a clean energy economy. So businesses and investors would probably prefer market mechanisms. I think Jerry's solution is a better one. A carbon tax is the way to go. But short of that, um, they'll support regulations. So there's no alter the alternative of denial is just not there. It's not realistic. Um, the alternative is more regulation, uh, more power to the EPA, or some sort of trade-off that is palatable to conservatives and would probably be sub get substantial support from the business and investor community that involves a market solution. I'm not sure the EPA completely disappears. Um, I'm not sure it completely gives up its jurisdiction over, over greenhouse gases. Um, but I think that's where we have to head. And I think that's the only, only way to get conservatives on board. And I think the business and investor community will respond very, very positively. And in fact, they're already in the fight, uh, even though government isn't. Okay, Jerry's going to get the conservatives on board. We got the business community on board. Uh, I think, you know, progressives have been on board. I, I remember 25 years ago, I was working for a progressive uh, Washington think tank modeling a carbon tax. So, uh, you know, so what kind of stands in the way and what, what are the, how can we make this sort of happy meeting of minds uh, happen uh, and, and kind of what are the barriers to it? And I think, you know, on the plus side, I think, you know, again, I do think more and more conservatives are starting to recognize that climate change is a, is a real problem that has to be addressed. You know, and, and I also think there's a real meeting of the minds that there needs to be a market solution. So, uh, you know, I don't think, I think progressives recognize that uh, certainly you, th there's a value and, and regulation, sort of the regulatory edifice that they've invested greatly in building uh, has been really important in playing a role, but, I, but they also clearly recognize that we're never going to get there without uh, a, a market signal, a price on carbon of some sort, and, and, you know, the preferred solution is, in fact, a carbon tax. So I think there's all that, you know, happy uh, meeting of minds. Uh, I thought I'd get a little bit into some of the nuts and bolts about where you're likely to have tensions, assuming you know, conservatives come around to this, where you're likely to have tensions on, on, on a carbon tax uh, with the progressive side. Uh, and I, I see that as being in, in basically three categories. One is, what do you do with this regulatory edifice that's been built up? Um, the second is, what do you do with all the money you collect uh, in the carbon tax? And the third is, how do you deal with how disruptive to the economy uh, 
putting in place a carbon tax would be. And uh, taking those one at a time, uh, in terms of the regulatory you know, structure that exists and the power of the EPA and, and clean power and all of these different mechanisms, CAFE standards, uh, I, I think it's a non-starter for progressives that you're just going to eliminate all of that at least quickly. And I think that's for two reasons. One is, uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly what the, the tax rate should be on carbon, and, and I think that it's, if anything, likely at the start to be uh, lower than is needed. And so I, I think progressives would look at it, you need some sort of backstop to that. So you still need this regulatory structure. But more important than that, there's a political economy to this. There's a politics to this. Whatever you think about the regulatory structure, and you may think it's terrible and it's costing the economy greatly, uh, but there is no public clamor to get rid of that regulatory structure. It really isn't on the radar screen of the American public. And it's really, it is not, there is, it is not a potent political argument to, to call for dismantling that. On the other hand, if you have a carbon tax in place, where people have seen the price they pay for uh, gasoline, for, for uh, home heating oil, whatever, go up, that is, that is at much greater political risk than the regulatory edifice. So if you're, argue, so if you're coming in and saying, we're going to throw out all the regulatory structure and we're put in place a carbon tax, you're going to be worried if you're a progressive or even if you just generally care about uh, uh, you know, get greenhouse emissions, you're going to be worried that you're setting yourself up uh, for a fall because you're wor there are going to be politicians attacking that. As soon as the, just because you pass it, it doesn't mean the fight ends, right? I've seen that in the Affordable Care Act, for example. And so you're, you're going to see you know, people coming at the carbon tax politically uh, to either get rid of it or to reduce the rate. It's going to be a, a source of controversy. And, and it's really hard, once you've gotten rid of a regulatory edifice, to put it back in place. It's not hard to raise or lower a carbon tax rate. So I think that's one reason why, and I'll get to wh how I think you can bridge that gap, but that's one reason uh, why I think for progressives it's a non-starter that you're just going to get rid of that or, or reduce it too much at the start. With regard to where the, the money goes, progressives are actually divided on this. So there's one school of thought that is, uh, you know, you collect all this money through the carbon tax and you give it all back. Uh, one, one characteristic of a carbon tax, it is regressive from a tax policy standpoint. It takes more as a share of income from low and middle income people than from, from high income people. And so, you know, one school of thought uh, on the progressive side is, well, we're going to give it all back and we're basically going to give it back in a distributionally neutral way. So if the poorest 20 percent, you know, pays X share of the carbon tax, we're going to get that money back to that class of people uh, through tax credits, through other mechanisms. The middle 20 percent, we're going to get their money back. Now, within those groups, income groups, of course, people who use more carbon will end up with a tax increase. People who use less carbon will end up with a tax cut. But you will have dealt with sort of the class issues of, of having a, a imposing a, a quite regressive tax. So that's one point of view of what you should do with all the revenue on the progressive side. Another view is you should just use it to spend, to, you know, to, to fund the progressive agenda. And no one's probably realistically pushing, pushing that at the, these days. But I think the center of gravity, though, is that you return maybe 60, 70, 80 percent of it, and you use the rest of the money to invest in new technologies so that to, to ease the transition to a clean economy, uh, and also to take care of people, well, people, industries, uh, or regions that are unduly affected by a, by, a, by a carbon tax. And that's how you use that money. And deal with adaptation. And some, Jerry alluded to some, some of this. So that's the other school of thought. I think on the conservative side, uh, you know, there's a range of views. But I think one view that isn't really, I don't think, ends up even being a Republican position, but it's fairly widely held from people who, who favor a carbon tax is maybe you do something for low income people but you use the rest of the money to sort of to to in in a, in a supply you know sort of conventional supply side tax cut so you do you know you reduce taxes on investment basically and uh, I actually think that doesn't even get out of the Republican Senate caucus from the standpoint because that really loads up the taxes on the middle class because they don't have enough investment income for it to for the cuts on investment side to really benefit them so you end up with a, a, a tax increase on the middle class are, which would be argued would 
to give money to the poor and the rich. And that's just, you know, every Republican senator is going to be thinking of that ad uh, when it comes time to voting on this. So I just I actually don't think you end up, you end up there. And I, I also think there's a way out of that uh, sort of difference between progressives and, and conservatives. And then lastly on, on disruption, I, you know, it's fairly self-evident, right? There are industries, individuals, uh, regions that that are going to be hurt. There's others that are going to be helped. And, and uh, you know, that transition is difficult because, you know, it's sort of the, the Etlinger rule of tax policy is those people who get a tax cut are, are more, are, who get a tax increase are much more, more mad than the people who get a tax cut are grateful. And so, you know, you would see that dynamic in play. Uh, uh, I think uh, with a carbon tax, no matter what you did with the money. Um, so, okay, so how do you kind of get get past these things. And I think, I think on the regulatory side, you, need, you may get rid of a regulation or here so that everybody saves face and that you can say you deregulated. I think more likely as you do things like you freeze phase-ins, you have sunsets. So you sunset some things, so 10 years from now, from when it's passed, uh, a lot of the regulatory uh, structure goes away, but by then, you know, you've gotten a sense of whether the, 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 the carbon tax has gotten entrenched, it's real, it's not going anywhere, it's part of the you know, real infrastructure of the country. So I think that's how you deal with the regulatory side. On the how do you spend the money side, I think frankly the only answer is you give all or most of it back. Because Republicans, if it's a net tax increase, you're just not going to get Republicans or libertarians, I'll let Jerry speak for himself, but uh, uh, you know, to, to embrace it. So you really do need to get, get the money back. Uh, and I think you largely just politically have to, you know, I have to think it's the right thing to do, but whether you think it's the right thing to do or not, I think politically you pretty much have to get it at least by income group to the people who, who are, to the groups that are paying it. Um, even though, you know, obviously, you know, some people say, well, give it back to the people whose carbon taxes go up like one by one, but that of course defeats the purpose of a carbon tax because you're not going to affect behavior then. But you know, by cl by income group, you get it back. And then on in terms of the dislocations that it's going to char that it's going to cause, y you do need to do something for people who are really uh, drastically affected, and that may take spending some money, um, some government money. Uh, but also, there's something to be said for phasing this in because one thing we know is that we don't really know all the consequences, right? We know certain, we know it's bad to be a coal miner with a carbon tax, but uh, there are things we don't know, and one way to deal with that is to phase it in uh, you know, reasonably quickly, but just so that you can see what dislocations are happening and, and, and deal with them as they, as they develop, and also just to allow the economy to adjust. So I think that's how we can get it done. Jerry, I think only fair just to give you an option to, to respond to comments of either Michael's or, or Joe's when you've had a chance to grab some water. And then we'll quickly get to some questions from the audience. We have some terrific questions. I won't, yes, it's on. It's on. I won't spend much time uh, responding, mostly because there's not much I disagree with. I agree with most of what uh, both speakers had to say. As far as the issue, however, of the trade-offs that may occur between regulation and a carbon tax. A couple of things that I think are important for the progressive community and environmentalists to keep in mind. To hold on like grim death to the existing regulatory infrastructure is to hold on like grim death to something that is not going to save you from drowning. <laughs> the differences between policy ambition, which is to prevent warming from exceeding two degrees Celsius, versus where policy is at present is so monumental, it is so deep, it is so amazingly large that for progressives and liberals to hold on to this policy, it may be the best that we've been able to produce thus far, but the only way we are going to see the kind of emission reductions we need in this economy is by a very powerful policy intervention one that in my opinion is outside and completely beyond the reach of the regulatory apparatus. It can only be done by aggressively pricing carbon in the economy. Nothing else is going to allow us to get from point A to point B. So while I agree with much of what was said, yes, it's easier to go after a tax than it is to go after a regulation. That's absolutely true. 
yes, we have a lot of uncertainty associated with how the economy responds to attacks. Will the emissions reductions be on the larger side or on the smaller side? There's a lot of dispute. The error bars there are very, very large. But let me remind you that if environmentalists and progressives are correct about the narratives they tell about clean energy and energy efficiency, that is nearly cost effective, if not already cost effective right now, vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels, then the carbon tax is going to produce far more emissions reductions than the median. It's only if my buddies at Heartland and Heritage and Cato and elsewhere are correct that clean energy and energy efficiency is nowhere near as competitive with fossil fuels as we're being led to believe, that the emissions reductions from a carbon tax will be on the low side. And so for progressives or liberals who are entertaining this conversation, is there a courage to these convictions or not? Now, politically, however, all that being said, what the right mix is is going to depend on a whole lot of moving pieces. So for instance, if I come to you and say, $25 economy-wide carbon tax recycled on a per capita basis back to the American people so it's not regressive, and you give up the clean power plan and the, the tax preferences for wind, energy, and solar, and a few other things like, say, auto fuel efficiency standards, which I've always wanted to get rid of. And if you're Sheldon Whitehouse, you're probably going to say, you're asking a lot for a $25 carbon tax. No. But if I say $40 carbon tax, then I might say yes. It really depends on the program design. How big is this tax going to be? How is it going to increase? So we can't know. This is, this is intuitive learning by negotiation and doing. So I don't have a line in the sand on these matters. Uh, the only other thing I want to do a, um, a dr address for a moment is whether we should impose a steep or a modest tax to allow the economy to adjust. 95% of the people in this conversation advocate a modest carbon tax to start with a strict escalator, 3 4% a year, something like that, so eventually it becomes large. That's where most people are. I'm not entirely sure I buy that. Just from an intellectual standpoint. Politically, might absolutely be the case. Economically or policy-wise, no. The best analogy I heard from this is a friend of mine named Bob Litterman. He was a partner at Goldman Sachs. He's on our board of directors. He was a key figure in moving me from point A to point B on this debate. The analogy he uses is, you're on a bicycle, Jerry. We are, like a society, on a bicycle, going very quickly downhill, very fast down a hill. And there's a curve coming up. I can't see around the curve. I have no idea what's beyond that curve. Is it a real steep hairpin curve? Is it real modest or what? But I'm going really fast. Do I hit the brakes hard now, or do I just kind of ease into this turn? No. He says, you hit the brakes now. There's time to adjust later. Because if you're wrong, you're going to go flying off that hill and into a, an off a cliff. I think that is a fairly persuasive argument for an aggressive and powerful tax now. Politically, however, we don't live in a world in which perfect logic may dictate policy choices. So politics is the art of the possible, not, in exhort, not exhortation for the impossible. So for the most part, I do agree with what he had to say. Thank you. So we have some terrific questions from the audience, and I want to share some of those with our panelists. This is for anybody all on the panel. The Clean Air Act doesn't apply to India, China, Nigeria that will soon have greater populations than the United States. What solutions are possible through U.S. action? This is great because this is the usual argument that we used to offer at the Cato Institute. No matter what the merits of doing something about climate change is, uh, might be, unilateral U.S. action, and if you run the emissions reductions that follow from unilateral U.S. action through a computer model, you find virtually no impact on temperature. And you will find this argument ad infinitum at the Cato Institute website and Heritage and elsewhere. It's just, and it's correct. So it implies global action, which nobody disagrees with. Do these organizations support global action? No, they don't. They scream bloody murder when anybody comes back, even with empty promises from Paris. So it's kind of disingenuous. But put that aside. If the, real, if the question is, how can we best induce international action on this topic? I'm with Bill Nordhaus and with Joe Stiglitz and other economists who say the best route is not UN confabs and ginormous negotiated agreements. We've done 24 of those meetings in 21 years and have produced very little. Far better to impose unilaterally a carbon tax in the United States economy and tax imports as if they were made here to reflect their carbon content so that our manufacturers are dealt with honestly. And then you provide an incentive for everybody who is exporting major, go major goods in the United States to impose their own carbon taxes so that they can capture the revenue that is otherwise being captured by the United States Treasury. 
I think that's far more likely to induce aggressive international action than going through this 24-year, 21-year and counting UN charade, which for the most part has produced very little relative to what we need to produce. But put that aside for a second. The point, however, is, is that we are already addressing greenhouse gas emissions unilaterally through U.S. public policy. The only functional question for conservatives and libertarians in the business community, in my, in my opinion, is can we do it cheaply? More cheaply than what we're doing now. And can we do it more effectively? And if we can, who cares? If we cut our own costs and we're able to do more to help the U.S. economy by deregulating, by making things more efficient, that in itself is its own reward. If the rest of the world follows, wonderful. But this is not a question about unilateral versus global action. We are already acting unilaterally. The question is, are we going to do it smartly or are we going to do it less smartly? Thank you, Jerry. Joe, Michael, do you want to I just add say, to that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, I, I think of it as a for people who know tax policy is a carbon added tax because you could work it like a value added tax and that sort of deals with all your all, all, all the border issues you know the catch there is measuring carbon on imports it's you know there's there are complicated uh, uh, issues with with impl implementation but yeah I think Jerry's absolutely right too it isn't a, a choice of unilateral or not and a bunch of the world is taking action you can make the you know it's not the Clean Air Act doesn't apply in other countries but they have their own schemes uh, as well, because we're not the only ones in the world who are recognizing this, and uh, there's certainly parts of the world that aren't, but there are also parts of the world that are. And you know, I think that a lot of these agreements and a lot of the the uh, mutual boosterism that's gone on around the world about having to address these issues has had some effect, but not as much as is needed, clearly. Thanks, Michael. Um, this is more of a question for Jerry uh, from one of the audience members. We saw Republican Bob Inglis take a hit for his leadership on climate. Have you seen your credibility impacted since your transformation? Do you see the tide changing within the Republican Party? Oh, my credibility is a different question than the tide changing within the Republican <laughs> Party. With some crowds, I'm a lot more popular than when I used to be. And with other crowds, I'm a lot less popular than I used to be. So I guess it depends on which, uh, which uh, group we're talking about. Within the GOP, uh, we, we, our, our main, just as an aside, the main purpose of the Niskanen Center is not to change opinions outside of Washington. I care about your opinions. That's why I'm here. Hopefully I'm having a good influence on them, making you a better person, smarter, and all that. But the reality is, is that that's not what we do. We are relentlessly focused on Washington, on elected members in the House and the Senate, their senior staff, committee staff, primarily Republicans, since we have some credibility within that tribe, but we also talk to Democrats, and we talk to all the people in the governing networks of the GOP and in the Democratic Party who influence how they think and what kind of public policies they entertain. We are relentlessly focused on Washington, D.C., and on what you would call those hideous evil insiders that run the government. And so in the course of that business, I've had a great deal of time to talk with elected Republicans uh, and senior staff on Republic, senior Republican staff and committees and in Republican leadership. And I can tell you that uh, what they say publicly and what they say privately is like night and day. It really is. Um, but many of them are afraid of becoming Bob English. The question is exactly correct. Now, Bob English is a great guy. I know him. He's wonderful. I, there's a lot of reasons I would like to be more like Bob English. But as a congressman, you'd rather be elected, currently employed congressman, and not, un not previously kicked out and now celebrated ex-congressman. You want to keep that former title. And until the Tea Party is no longer hanging like the sort of Democles over the neck of Republican officials, I think that we are going to be in this position we're in. What I think is required is a jailbreak. And the reality is that the Tea Party movement, even prior to this primary season, had moved from 34% of public support to 17% of public support. When you ask people, do you identify with or sympathize with the Tea Party movement? So they've already lost half their strength since 2010. They probably would have collapsed more had it not been for Coke money. But so they've still got power, but it's half of what they used to. And if, if, if what's playing out in American politics will continue to play out through November, the last of the Tea Party movement is going to be blasted in a glorious explosion of apocalyptic death. 
And once that occurs, I think there might be very well a different conversation in the GOP. You forget that as recently as 2008, the Republican Party nominated a presidential candidate who was a conservative who argued for aggressive climate action that was on the same level of aggression that we've seen from the Obama administration. And did conservatives try to have his head, hand his head to him for that? No. Did they block the nomination over it? No. They rallied to this man. The point is, is it looks like the Republican Party is frozen in ice given a lot of its positions. But the reality was, it's not all that long ago the GOP looked a little different on this topic. It's primarily a function of the Tea Party movement that is the explainer, and I think the Tea Party movement is about to become a significant thing of the past. So uh, we have about one minute left for questions, and I'm going to close with a question uh, again for Jerry. Um, probably a good question to end on. You, you, say, you say that you accepted the... Hang on, I'm going this wrong. <laughs> Let's try it again. Um, if the science of climate change didn't convince you, what did? Well, there's a long train of things that helped move me from point A to point B. Uh, the science did, in some extent, set the stage. In the course of overseeing the work we did at the Cato Institute, uh, some degree of due diligence was required, and the more of it I engaged in, the more I found the narratives were dodgy and didn't hold up to scrutiny. And the weight of that evidence relentlessly coming in year after year after review did indeed help move my position. But the most fundamental thing which moved me was the observation that this ferocious dispute about what's the most likely outcome from climate change, and let's face it, the climate skeptics are not implausibly wrong when they argue that it will be on the lower end of the IPCC range of possible outcomes. After all, the IPCC gives us a range, and if you're within the range, you're scarcely some gibbering chimpanzee, and the so-called lukewarmers in the scientific community are, for the most part, right there on the knife's edge at the low end of what the IPCC thinks is likely. So it's a defensible argument. But what moved me was that, one, I began to lose faith in that defensible argument, and I didn't think it carried. But importantly, once you realize it's not about the most likely outcome, it's about the full range of possible outcomes and the negative outcomes that lead to truly apocalyptic outcomes, you know, uh, sci-fi kind of stories, really catastrophic stuff is on the end of bad things happening, not on the end of good things happening. And, and wrestling with that directly, I was the fundamental thing which changed my position in this, probably more than anything else. 